are going to talk about identification methods of macroinvertebrates. There are two ways of identifying macroinvertebrates. The first is with a dichotomous key, and the second method would be a book with pictures and descriptions. I find it's easiest to combine these methods and use both a book with good pictures and descriptions of the families, as well as a good dichotomous key. The level of identification that you need is an important thing to know. Obviously, the higher level of identification, uh, the more specific level of identification towards a species level is going to be more difficult. That takes a lot more skill. A lot of times this is not something that volunteers or early students would be able to do. A more general level of identification to order or family is a lot easier for people with limited experience with bugs. However, the more specific identification you can get to, the more information you will have about your site. The closer to the species level that you can ID, the better conclusions you can make about that site. I'm going to go through order by order and give some identification features of our common macroinvertebrates. We typically identify down to family, which is much more difficult than order. Again, just identifying to the order doesn't tell you a lot about the water quality, but it gives you a really good starting place. Once you know the order, you can then key out the macroinvertebrate to a family or even to a species level from there. I'm going to start with the mayflies, Ephemeroptera. These are very common. Some of the mayflies are pretty tolerant and can be in slow-moving water, even somewhat water with some level of pollution in it, but in general these are a sensitive group. Uh, the mayflies typically have three tail filaments. This is a primary identification feature. And also they'll have gills on the side of their abdomen. These gills might be forked, they might be long filamentous gills, or they might look like plates. But they all have these three tails. Uh, the mayfly is another one who has a life cycle that involves a terrestrial adult form, eggs are laid in the water, and the nymphs are in the water for around a year before emerging as adults to repeat the process. Within the order Odonata, there are dragonflies and damselflies. They're a little bit different, they're pretty distinct to tell the two apart. The damselflies, like the mayflies, have three tail segments. The tails in a damselfly are actually the gills, so you will not see gill plates or gill filaments on the abdomen of a damselfly. Also, the damselflies have this T-square head, so they have a broad head on a long slender body. The mouth of dragonflies and damselflies is very distinct. They have a trapdoor mouth, it's hinged, and they're able to shoot the mouth out and catch other small macroinvertebrates. Here in the center is an adult damselfly. To tell adult damselflies and dragonflies apart, when at rest, the adult damselfly holds its wings up on its back. The dragonfly will hold its wings out parallel with the ground. Here's the dragonfly for comparison. Remember, the damselfly had three tail filaments that were actually gills. The dragonfly will usually have three small spikes, but not extended filaments. Again, the trapdoor mouth, just like the damselfly. Dragonflies can vary a lot in their larval appearance. Some of them are really large and flat like a leaf. Some of them have really long spidery legs. Uh, most commonly, you'll see these ones that are they're a lot more broad than the damselfly. They don't have the three gill filaments off the tail. But again, no gill plates on the side of the abdomen. Not three tails, but they still have this trapdoor mouth. Here's the adult with its wings spread parallel to the surface. Stoneflies, these are another sensitive species. We typically find stoneflies in fast-moving, well-oxygenated water with a gravelly or cobble substrate. The stoneflies will have two tail segments. The mayfly, remember, has three. Mayflies and stoneflies can look pretty similar. Stonefly will have two tail segments and these three thoracic plates on the thorax. The adult stonefly is just a small moth-like creature. Uh, you'll see them on overhanging vegetation across the streams. The caddisflies are a really cool group. 
These are the ones that build their houses out of whatever materials are in their native stream. Some of them might use small shells, strips of vegetation. This one has combined some rocks and sticks. Uh, some of the caddisflies do not create a house. This is a free-living caddisfly that's very common around here. It's the hydrocycid caddisfly. These are free-living. They'll often build a net attached to the rocks, and they use that net as sort of their hangout and also to, to catch small invertebrates that they eat. People actually collect caddisfly larvae and use them to make jewelry out of the cases. The adult, again, is just a small moth-like creature that you'll usually see around streams. Sometimes they're out on the rocks on the side of the stream. Megaloptera is an interesting family. It only has two, two genera in it. These are the Dobson flies, uh, the alder flies, and fish flies. This is what most people refer to as a Helgramite. These guys get pretty big. They might get four inches long. Uh, they have very powerful jaws. The Helgramite is usually in good, clean water uh, with an, a rocky substrate. Again, they need good oxygen levels but they can actually withstand the stream drying out. These guys can live under rocks on the edge of the stream for a limited amount of time if the water level gets really low. Large jaws, uh, filaments on the side of the abdomen, and the, the Helgramite will have two hooks on the tail that they use to hold themselves down in the current, and the alder fly larva will have one pointed central filament. The true bugs are a pretty diverse order. Hemiptera or Heteroptera, you may see it either way. These guys all have a set of wings on their back that cross and form an X. It's pretty easy to see this X, even on the long, slender water scorpion. When you actually see them, they have this very distinct X on their back. They all have a piercing, sucking mouth. Most of these can and will bite if you pick them up. Um, these are our, our water skimmers, water striders, the ones that live on the top of the water and actually walk on the water tension. These are very common. These are usually pretty tolerant because most of them can fly. So if water conditions are really poor where they're at, they can fly to another water body. The diptera are true flies. This is a, a huge order of insects. And most of the aquatic larvae look very much like maggots. We're all familiar with terrestrial maggots. Aquatic fly larvae look very similar. Usually don't have any legs. They may have some fleshy pro legs like a caterpillar. Some will have a visible head. Others will not. Um, they will not have wings. They will not have wing pads. They will not have any segmented legs. They may or may not have a breathing tube on their abdomen. A lot of these that do have that breathing tube can live in very stagnant, very polluted water as they're breathing atmospheric oxygen. And these turn into annoying things like mosquitoes and black flies. Coleoptera are the beetles. Beetles is a pretty large group. Uh, most of these are a hard-shelled insect. We're all familiar with terrestrial beetles. Aquatic beetles look very similar. They have a pair of of fleshy, thin, membranous wings underneath the hard-shelled wings. Fully developed wings with hard covers, no external gills. We're not going to see any gill flaps, gill filaments. Six legs, even the larval forms, will have six segmented visible legs. They're off they often have very conspicuous jaws. These are another one that won't hesitate to bite you if you pick them up. The larva may have a tuft of gills on their abdomen. This is a riffle beetle here. They have a little trapdoor flap on the end of their abdomen, and they do have filamentous gills that they can open that trapdoor up and help get more oxygen into their bodies. Not all the macroinvertebrates that we look at are insects. Here are some of the very common macroinvertebrates that are not insects. Most people are familiar with the crayfish. There's also some very small freshwater shrimp, assorted snails, mussels, leeches, and an assortment of aquatic worms. If you're not familiar with using a dichotomous key, I'd recommend getting a few of them. They're all a little bit different. You should always start at the beginning. Don't think that 
you can jump into the middle of a key and go from there and save yourself some, from some time. You should always start at the beginning. If there are terms you don't know, which there probably will be, look them up before you just make assumptions and proceed. Read each of your options before choosing one of them. Follow the steps carefully and get familiar with the key that you're using. Uh, typically on a dichotomous key, it'll, you'll have two options. You start at the beginning and you'll have two options. And from there, you'll have two more options. Read each one fully. Pick the one that matches your specimen the closest. This is the conclusion of the macro ID portion.